Well, every year we ask ourselves, uh, just because we know there are some here maybe for the first time or some visitors, some guests, or some of our own children who, as they get older, they come and be part of this service, and that is, why do we do this? Why do we rehearse the past? Why do we reaffirm uh, the central tenets of the Protestant Reformation? And the answer is simple, and that is that we tend to forget. Uh, we drift away. That's just a natural human condition. We sing a hymn, right? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. There's so much in life that presses upon us, and we have a lot to think about, and, and so we need to come back to the central truths, the central tenets, and there's also a tendency to give in to pressure, to give in to cultural pressure, to, you know, modify our convictions a bit, to fit the culture better. We uh, love to be loved. <laughs> We like to be liked. That's also very natural, right? And, uh, and so standing firm on things that are central and profound are very important, but sometimes it could be difficult, right? The truth of God is unchanging, and so we can't allow it to change, nor can we drift from it. Those of you who are part of the church, you've seen from the book of Titus uh, that it's the duty not only of pastors but each generation to hold firm, hold firm, to the apostolic truth, you know, to the word of truth as taught, you know. The Protestant Reformation some 500 years ago was a restoration, a recovery of the central tenets of the gospel, of the apostolic truth of the gospel. And what happened was that by going back to Ad Fontes, to the original text, to the Greek manuscripts and so forth, and not to the Latin translations, and men like Luther and others were able to biblically answer this question. And the question is this, how can a sinful human being be made right with a holy God? How can we be set right in the presence of a holy God? Now, that was a question that people in that day thought about more than we tend to think about in our day. But it was incredibly important to those people in those days, and in particular to um, religious men like Luther and Calvin and others. And so shortly after the Protestant Reformation, uh, how they answered the question, how they answered that question, how can a sinner be made right with God, was slowly distilled into five slogans or five statements and uh, that summed up what had been taught and recovered during the Reformation. In other words, these five statements weren't put together by any one individual during the Reformation. The teaching was always there, but later it was distilled in order to be memorable. And those phrases are called the five solas. Uh, sola is Latin for alone. And many of you knows what those are, but let me repeat them for all of you and maybe for some of our children or some of our guests. The five solas of the Reformation are Scripture alone, uh, grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone, and to God alone be the glory. And what, what the Protestant Reformation recovered in answering the question was this. How do we answer that question? On what basis can we answer the question, how can a sinful human being made right with God? Scripture alone has the authority to answer that question. Not Scripture and traditions. Scripture alone has the authority to answer that question. And what does Scripture alone teach us? Scripture alone teaches us that people are set right with God by grace alone. That is God's divine favor, God's acting, God's doing. And that the basis for grace alone reaching us is the merits of Christ alone. The doing, the dying and doing of Christ alone. Not the, the doings of Christ plus our doings. And that the doings of Christ alone are received as a free gift of God's grace through the instrumentality of faith alone. Sola fide. Not faith plus some degree of human merit, some degree of human effort, but faith alone. And the result of this, of course, is that God alone receives the glory, soli deo gloria. Why? Because salvation belongs to the Lord. God completes it from beginning to the end. Jesus, who is the Christ, is not some doorman that, you know, makes it possible for you and me to be saved, and he will open the door to those of us who have done what we need to do on our part. No, he is the Savior. 
Salvation belongs to the Lord. And a key verse, of course, is uh, the middle of Ephesians chapter 2, known by many of you, memorized by many of you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. What is the gift? Salvation by grace through faith is the gift of God. Not, a result, not as a result of works that no man, that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, <laughs> created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by good works, but we are created in Christ, saved by grace through faith for good works, right? Uh, and so that's at the very heart of the Protestant Reformation. And every year we, uh, we tend to take one of those uh, solas, one of those alones, and focus on it. Tonight is Christ alone. Christ alone. What do we mean when we say Christ alone? What we mean that when we confess that we're saved by Christ alone, we are declaring that his, we are declaring his all-sufficiency and his uniqueness to be the sole basis for, by which I can be forgiven and set right with God. Christ alone is the Savior. We're stating that we believe that the person of Christ, who he is, and what he accomplished on our behalf alone is sufficient for our salvation, that there is no need to add to it, and there's no other way as well. Christ alone means he alone is the Savior in his work, and also that there is no other way, you know. Uh, the person and work of Christ is the sole basis, the sole grounds upon which we can be accepted by God. Now, the church of the Middle Ages, they spoke about Christ. Of course they did. A church that failed to talk about Christ could hardly call itself a Christian church, right? But, but the medieval Catholic church had added many human achievements through the sacraments and so forth on top of the merits of Christ so that no one could say for sure that they were saved. How much do you have to do? How, who's going to measure it? Who has the right to tell me how much I have to do? And if I don't do enough, I end up in purgatory, even though the Scripture says, 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God and over that you may know that you have eternal life. And so that was the struggle, right? It was no longer possible to say during the Middle Ages there in the medieval church that Christ alone is sufficient for us to be set right before God. So, we understand what it means on, the, on a simple basis. And I want to say again that the Protestant reformers simply recovered what the Scriptures had always said and what Christ himself had said. Jesus taught himself, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that's a very exclusive statement, Right? Today, that's a very unpopular thing, right, to, to be so exclusive, right? And, and Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when he had been filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we, by which we can be saved. There is no other name. And Jesus says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, that is very exclusive, and we live in a time that finds that uh, very oppressive, right? Because we reject narratives that speak for all of us. Uh, the time in which we live has been called a time of prescriptive pluralism. Let me explain what that means. So pluralism, pluralism is a simple idea, right? That, that, all that simply means there are many religions. Well, there's always been pluralism, right? That's why ancient Israel was, was always tempted to go f chasing other gods because there were always other gods, quote, and, and religions. And when Paul uh, went into Greece and he went up there on Mars Hill, what did he see? He see all these statues to various gods, right? There's always been pluralism. Prescriptive pluralism is this. It's being told, being told that all religions are equally viable and valid and you must accept that or you are intolerant. That's prescriptive pluralism. And it's just about no worse sin in our day than being called intolerant, right? You're a bigot. 
And that's the spirit of the age in which we live. And it's fair to ask the question, well, who's they? <laughs> you know, who's they saying the prescribing, right? Uh, these guys on talk shows? I mean, who are these people? Prescribing pluralism. Well, these are the cultural elites, people that have power, that have influence. These are the cultural gatekeepers, and it's primarily in the West. It's this way in Europe and, and, and in Great Britain and in North America, uh, and of course, permeating other areas, but it's primarily in the West. And we are told that you're bigots and intolerant unless you accept that all religions are equally valid, you see. Now, I think that um, most of you came into this room tonight already. Most of you, I, I, I can't speak for all of you, but most of you would say, well, I understand what Christ alone means and I, and I believe in it. So tonight, what am I going to do? Tonight, what I want to do is go over five quick reasons to, that you may continue to believe in Christ alone and be strengthened in your convictions about Christ alone. And I would hope that some of you would come to see that salvation is found in Christ alone, why it is found. So five quick reasons why we believe in Christ alone, why Christ alone is the all-sufficient Savior. First of all, because of his unique birth. And all of these things are found in divine revelation. Scripture alone has authority to tell us this. His unique birth, Christ alone was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. The prophet Isaiah spoke of this. We talk about it at Christmas time, some 500 years before the time of Christ. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Uh, Matthew in his gospel, chapter 1, quotes this. And then Luke in his gospel gives a more detailed account. He says that, uh, that an, angel, an angelic being, Gabriel, appeared before Mary and, and told her these words. He let her know. He says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, listen to this, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. This is a teenage girl. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, an eternal kingdom. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said, of course she says, you know, how will this be? <laughs> what else would you say? How can this be since I'm a virgin? Good question. And the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, the God who creates, when, who, the God who says, let there be light. He said, the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jesus Christ alone is sufficient to be our Savior because of his unique birth. Mary, his mother, was able to conceive this child, Jesus, the Christ, without a human father. Now, why is that important? We keep flowing down. The second, the second uh, reason for Christ alone being sufficient is because of his unique nature. He had a unique birth, which led to a unique nature, his unique person. Christ alone is both fully God and fully man at the same time. Fully God and fully man, not merely God or merely man, right? And so the virgin conception was the means by which he became the God-man. I say became because he always was the eternal son, and, but he became the God-man when he, he added humanity to his own eternal nature. And had he been normally conceived, that is, if he had a human father and a human mother, then he would be fully man, but he would not be fully God. And so he was conceived in this miraculous way, born as God and man together. That's, that's what we think about and we celebrate here in a few weeks at Christmas. You understand? The incarnation is in a glorious miracle, and it's an essential doctrine to the Christian faith. Because he needs to be God-man in order to be our Savior. And we'll go into that in just a few moments. And Scripture affirms both his humanity and his deity in several places, several ways. For example, in 1 Timothy 2.5, Paul says, There is one mediator, just one, between God and man. Only one who can touch both parties, right? One mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He emphasizes at that moment the, the humanity of Jesus Christ, but the, his deity is also 
uh, emphasize another context. You, most of you know the Gospel of John. John chapter 1 begins how? In the beginning. What beginning? The beginnings of all beginnings, right? In the beginning. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, a term he uses for the Christ. And he says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down verse 14, and the Word became flesh and indwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. And so this affirms several things. It affirms that Christ was preexistent. He existed before he was born, the son of Mary, Jesus, the son of Mary, right? And what he did was he added humanity to his eternal nature, to his divine nature. Again, Jesus pointed at this many times. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I and the Father are one. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, he affirms it in various and different ways. And so Christ has a unique birth and a unique nature. He's both God and man, but we must stress at this point that in his humanity, his humanity was a sinless humanity. In other words, he was not born with the same rebellious anti-God spirit that we are all born with, what we call total depravity. He was not born with that. You say, how so? Well, the virgin conception resulted in not only in him being the God-man, but being the God and man who is sinless in his nature. Uh, how's that? Well, the Scripture teaches that sin, that Inbred of depravity is passed on from the first man, from Adam, down through the heads of families, through the fathers, through the line of the fathers. Uh, that, the, uh, the Ten Commandments uh, carries this idea forward when it says, uh, it says that uh, the sins of the father uh, will be visited through the third and fourth generation. And so in the conception of Jesus... The Holy Spirit took the place of the human father. You think of that. And so he, the, Jesus did not receive the, the sinful nature that was passed down through the headship of the first man. That's a miracle. And so the result is that he's both fully God and fully man, yet without sin. Uh, as my uh, professor Bruce Ware used to say, do you know anybody else like that? <laughs> have you met anybody else <laughs> like that? No, <laughs> we have not. And so Christ alone is God incarnate. Um, yeah, let's see what I read, Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, literally in son. In other words, through prophets and now by means of sonship. His own son came to us, whom he appointed the heirs of all things through whom he also created the world. Here it is. He is the radiance, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe. That's Christ, Christ the Son. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is Christ, you see. So Christ alone is able to be our all-sufficient Savior because he had a unique birth which resulted in a unique nature, right? He is a unique person. And this unique nature qualifies Christ alone to be our Savior. The next question is, well, how so? How does that qualify him? How is it that he's God and man? How does that qualify him to be the only Savior for humanity? Well, a man named Anselm argued our Savior must be fully man in order to take the place of men, yet without sin, and die in their stead. And he must be fully God in order for the value of his sacrificial payment to satisfy the demands of an infinite holy God. You understand what he's saying there? He's saying that our rebellion, our rejection against God, 
uh, our, our fall into sin is a cosmic rebellion. And what we deserve is what? An infinite punishment, an infinite hell, because we have violated, we've snubbed, we've rejected and offended an infinite God. And so if that punishment is to be paid, it has to be paid by an infinite person. That's why hell is everlasting. It's hard to think about things like that, isn't it? But that's what Scripture affirms. Hell is eternal because that's how much we've offended an eternally holy God. And only an infinite person could pay this price and pay it in an instant because of his infinite value as God. Only an infinite person can pay for sin that is to be paid forever, right? Because he himself is forever. Now, again, since no one else in history <laughs> uh, qualifies, we'll move on to his, uh, his next uniqueness. <laughs> Not only does he have a unique birth and a unique uh, nature and a, as a person, but this also led to a unique life a unique life. You know, Jesus was born, we said, without a sinful human nature, but he went on to live a sinless human life. I've been asked sometimes, and sometimes from uh, some of my grandchildren or other young people, and say, well, why didn't God just send Jesus, like, fully grown and boom, right to the cross, you know? <laughs> why all this other stuff? <laughs> well, because uh, in order to satisfy God's justice, and I'll get more to it, he, he not only needed to represent us in the moment of the payment, but he also needed to be tested, and he needed to live a perfectly righteous life, which the first man was, was supposed to do but did not. And so he was tested. He was proven. He fulfilled all righteousness. I'll explain more in just a moment. He, to say this, he was tested and tempted, uh, uh, but he chose to obey the Father, right? He needed to not only be sinless in nature, but he needed to live a sinless life. Now, I, again, that, that is amazing because I think, I, this is how I thought for many years. You kind of think, well, this is kind of automatic, right? Because he's God too, right? So, you know, he lives a perfect life. Yeah, 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 of course. But that's not the case, beloved. Scripture says that he did not regard equality with God a thing to be selfishly grasped, but he set aside the free exercise of his deity. He added humanity to himself, and then he submitted himself to the Father, and he obeyed where we ought to obey and won't. In other words, the life he lived, which was a sinless life, he didn't live automatically relying upon his deity, but he lived the life of a human being who was trusting the Father and relying upon the Holy Spirit, the same life we're supposed to live. And he did it. It's amazing. He, it's glorious, really, when you think about it, you see. Uh, that's the kind of life he lived. Uh, he, it, 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 you see him wrestling with those moments that are severe. Why? Because exactly what was happening. Think of him in the Garden of Eden, right? Excuse me, the Garden of Gethsemane. Sweating the great uh, drops of, uh, of blood. Uh, because he's, he, he's facing the wrath that is about to consume him. And so he lived the life we ought to live, and he did it perfectly. And you say, well, why is that essential, right? If he was already born sinless, the sinless life of Christ, here it is, is essential. Not just his nature, but his sinless life is essential for our justification. Now, what does that mean? I know that's big Bible words, right? Justification. Remember, that's a courtroom term. The courtroom term, it's a verdict, a once-for-all verdict, it's the judge declaring that someone is just in his eyes, meaning what? Not guilty. It happens in an instant, and it's a final verdict. Justification is God declaring that he will treat us as being just, as being not guilty, even though we are. Even though we are sinners and remain capable of sinning and continue to sin, in fact. Um, it's a gift of God. Let me, let me go a little further with that. Uh, some of you have probably heard that justification is being treated just as if what? I never sinned, right? Just as if I never sinned. Good, but that's not all of it. 
It's being treated just as if I never sinned and just as if I always obeyed. As if I always said yes to God, you see. And so he lived that life. He always said yes. He submitted himself to the Father's will, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what Paul says. That's a perfectly righteous life. Now you begin to understand why it's important, right? Because we have a double problem. You see, we not only need a debt paid, removed, but we need to be perfectly righteous, right? So we need our debt paid by somebody, but that just makes our bank account zero, right? Now we need somebody to put some money in it, right? And so we need both a negative removal of our guilt and we need a positive presence of righteousness if we're going to stand before the righteous holy God. And where do you think we get the payment and where do you think we get the righteousness? We get it from the unique Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who lived the perfect life and earned the human righteousness which is credited to us and paid the debt which we owed. And so he lived a unique life, a perfect life. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he, was made, he, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, right, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But he knew no sin of his own. And if he had sin of his own, then he couldn't represent us, right? Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. No, Christ understands us. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And you know he was tempted beyond us. Why? Because we would give in where he would hold out forever. And so he's felt the weight, the strain of temptation, whereas we were already broken, right? First Peter 2.22, he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. So he had a unique birth. He had a unique nature. He lived a unique life, uh, a perfect life. And then because of that, he suffered a unique death. His death was a very unique death. Everyone dies, uh, very religious and, and, and good people die, bad people die, all people die. But Christ's death was unlike any others because it was a death that atoned for sin. It was a death that endured eternal wrath from the Father. He alone could take upon himself our sin and pay the debt he owed because he alone had no sin of his own. And this he did. This is good news. This is the gospel. This is what he did. This is Easter, right? This is Good Friday for us. Christ alone, listen, Christ alone can be our Savior uh, because he died a voluntary, penal, substitutionary death that satisfied the Father's justice. Let's think about those briefly. It was a voluntary death, right? He gave himself, right? He gave himself up. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep. No one takes it from me. I have authority to lay it down and take it up again, right? Galatians, Paul said, he gave himself for me. Now, see, that's a Christian. If you could understand that and believe it, you're, you're a Christian. That always astonished Paul. He said he gave himself for me. He loved me. It was a voluntary death. You know, some people mock the Christian faith and they call the crucifixion of Jesus cosmic child abuse. As if God the Father somehow twisted the Son's arm to do this. But Jesus said, I laid my life down freely. He came to that person. It was a penal death. What's that mean? It was a penalty. It's the payment of a penalty. What was the penalty? The wages of sin is death, right? The wages of sin is death, not just physical death. We all endure physical death, but a, an eternal death, the second death, the lake of fire, hell. He endured that because he's an infinite person, and he could endure it in an instant, again, because of his infinite value. It was a penal death. Death. Again, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It was a substitutionary death. Again, on our behalf. It was done in our place, in our stead. Uh, so many passages that we could read. Let me read a few before we finish our time. Surely he has borne our griefs. Whose griefs? Our griefs. 
He's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. Romans, I'll jump to Galatians. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, right? 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sin, once the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 2.24, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, right? Well, that just, that says it all right there. It was voluntary. He went to the cross. It, it was uh, penal. It was a payment, right? He himself bore our sins, and, and it was substitutionary in his body on the cross, our sins. And lastly, it was a, a death that satisfied God's justice, because what is the wages of sin? Death. What kind of death? An eternal death. What was laid upon Christ on that day? The wrath of God was placed upon him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. He treated him like sin and treated him like we alone deserve to be treated. That's a tremendous thing. That's why he's a glorious Savior. For by a single offering, Hebrews 10, 14, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. What a statement. One offering of himself. He has perfected, done, it's over. To tell us die, it's finished. He has perfected forever. All those who are being set apart, those who are belonging to God. And in Colossians 2, God made a life, made us, made you a life together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Here's how he did it. Listen, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. How did he do it? This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. <laughs> awesome, right? And so he is a unique person because he experienced a unique birth. He lived a unique sinless life and he also died a unique one-of-a-kind death, a death that satisfies the Father's wrath for us. But it doesn't end there. The fifth and last one, we have a few minutes left here and we got to get all the way to Easter and that is that he also experienced a unique resurrection. Amen. <laughs> See, it doesn't end on the cross. It doesn't stop there. It goes as far as the resurrection. His work was not complete at the cross. The resurrection is essential to the gospel message. Don't forget that. Remember what we've quoted it several times the last few weeks, 1 Corinthians 15, right? Paul says, I delivered to you as of first importance. This, this is like, it should be like an echo now for you, right? I delivered to you as of first importance, first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared, right? And then he appeared. And how is that essential? Say, why does the resurrection have to be part of it? Well, Paul goes on in that same chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 and says, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then you're still in your sins. You say, what do you mean we're still in our sins if he isn't raised? I thought his death was enough. Listen, if his death was supposed to pay for the price of sin, and what is the ultimate price of sin? Death. <laughs> eternal death, and if he supposedly paid for it, then death should have no longer any power over him if he has satisfied it because he has no sin of his own. And so he had to be raised from the dead. The resurrection is the, is the capstone of his work on our behalf. It vindicates him. It, it verifies the fact that the payment was in full, stamped, received, done. Death, sin had been vanquished, rise from the dead. And then he appeared. He appeared to Peter and the 12 and then to 500 at one time. Yes, Christ alone is a sufficient Savior because Christ alone rose from the dead triumphant over sin. In Acts chapter 2, Peter pre preached and said, God raised him, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. 
No longer, you see. And in Romans 4, 25, Paul says, listen, faith will be counted to you as righteousness. He says, just like Abraham, right? Abraham believed God and it was counted as righteousness to him. Faith is counted as righteousness to us, and here I quote, us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses to the cross and was raised for our justification, right? So we might stand before God uh, just and declared not guilty. So Christ alone uh, is the basis for our salvation. Yeah. Why do we believe that Christ alone is sufficient to be our Savior? Because of his unique birth, his unique nature, his unique sinless life, his unique death, and his unique resurrection. Christ alone was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life as the God-man, but as a man trusting in the Father. Christ alone earned a perfect human righteousness, a perfect record, right? He alone culminated this obedience by going to the cross, and then on that cross, he suffered a voluntary penal substitutionary death that fully satisfied the Father's justice. And then he alone was raised from the dead uh, for our justification. And all of this was the Father's design. This is God's plan of salvation. This is how we answer the question. How can a sinful person be made right with God? Not by trying harder. Not by trying to outlive someone else. Not by believing in Jesus and doing more. But by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. That God alone may receive the glory. And the full benefits, the full benefits of all that Christ earned when he went to that cross and was raised. What are those full benefits? Justification, forgiveness, eternal life, sanctification, adoption, the Holy Spirit indwelling you, and the hope and promise of resurrection. All of that is a gift of God's grace received by faith alone. That's humbling, but it's the only way. The wages of sin is death. And here's the other part of that verse. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're here tonight and you're not sure you're a Christian, the full benefits of what Christ has done does not depend on you being a better person, on being more religious, on trying harder, cleaning up your life. You come as you are to God tonight. You humble yourself and say, God, help me believe in Christ. Turn to Christ tonight. Trust him. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's why we believe in Christ alone. Let me pray, and we'll sing another song as we finish our time. Lord God in heaven, thank you for this meditation tonight, this time we spent reflecting on the glory of who Christ your eternal son is. And Lord, even though we've just scratched the surface of this, still it's profound and deep and Maybe overwhelming for some, Lord, to hear so much. And I pray, God, for your mercy to all who heard tonight, that you grant us understanding, that you would open our hearts and eyes to the fullness of your salvation, that you would free us, dear God, from, from being estranged from you and being in bondage to sin, that you would call on us, dear God, and grant us faith, and that people would come and trust you with their whole heart, Lord. Oh, Lord, do a work in all of us. And help us, God, to stand in our present age, firm, holding, firmly to the truth of the gospel. I pray, God, you give us that, as we said this morning, Lord, that, uh, that compassionate love that will lead us, dear God, to help others understand who Christ is. Now, be with us, Lord, throughout the rest of this night. and our time, we'll spend, Lord, together. Bless our fellowship in Christ's name. Amen.